the slide deck is available for you to um, to use on our eday website so any links or any slides that you might need a little bit of extra time um, to read through you can do that um, here shortly um, so thank you for joining us first of all we know that for some of you this is spring break and uh, the next few weeks are a little bit of an unknown for you so we're excited that you took the initiative to come early and uh, learn some strategies so today we'd like to talk to you about keeping that communication open with your students as educators we know that the relationship with students kind of opens up the door to learning so we want you to keep communicating with students and keep reaching out to them um, along with that comes communicating with parents and it might look a little different than what you're used to um, but we have some strategies to keep parents in the loop and um, connected with them online learning and remote teaching are very different aspects to some of you so we are going to focus on some intentional design and how it looks in an online format as opposed to a face-to-face -face format a lot of you build your own lesson plans build your own curriculum and have creative ways of using content in your classroom and all of those skills that you have will serve you well in the next coming weeks um, so we'll show you some examples of how those face-to-face -face activities could look in an online format. And then lastly, we'll talk about how to set up an online classroom. There are numerous platforms that are opening up to educators um, for free. So today we're only showing one example, um, but there's many out there that you could choose from. We are showcasing Google Classroom, which is free through the G Suite. Um, if you're interested in using that. So we'll show you some examples of how you can place content and lesson plans um, within Google Classroom. So the first thing we'd like to kind of discuss is keeping that relationship with your students open. Um, it's not uh, normal, really, anything that we're doing right now. Um, it's working from home. It's a different schedule for everyone. So remembering that the things happening right now are not normal. Um, it, it needs to be a factor in, in reaching out to your students. So we encourage you to be available for one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions um, in some form. Students who are able to reach out to you and connect to you um, could have an outlet that they wouldn't otherwise have. So we encourage you to be there for your students. Um, continue to support them um, and we encourage you to reach out and find out what their home situations are like um, every home is different right now and, and considering many different dynamics uh, it helps you kind of help that student so large families can look different when you have four students that are um, different grades um, if you have students that are ranging from a senior to a third grader in the house, it looks different than a family that only has one student or families that have intergenerational um, members of their family. They're having different uh, dynamics right now and they're restricted in different ways. So understanding about the family's dynamic helps you. Um, limited devices, if there are three kids, in, in a household, but there's only one laptop and the parents are working from home, um, that limited time with the device will limit their ability to be in your classroom or finish the work that you provide to them. So take that into, into account as well. Um, care providers and working parents, um, everybody has a different dynamic. You know, there are people that are going to hospitals every day to work their regular job um, and they're coming home and you have parents that are working full-time jobs and trying to be a teacher at home. And a job that was filled by two people is now kind of covered by one. So understanding those dynamics and what's available uh, helps you as a teacher plan. Um, even consider technological barriers. We have Idaho students that live with grandparents and they might not be that familiar with a tablet or how to log into a Chromebook. Um, so all of those dynamics kind of play into what you would offer and modifying assignments for certain students. Um, building that connection and showing to students, hey, I, I know that you have 
limited access. So let's think of something you can do outside um, and report in a different way. Uh, it's important to be flexible. If there was ever a time to be flexible, it might be right now. Um, consider things that you wouldn't normally do, possibilities. Um, if a student comes to you with an idea, try to make it work, because at least the student's trying and they're, they're reaching out to you. So um, provide opportunities for students to collaborate online. Your face-to-face -face classroom isn't your students alone at their own desk. Students collaborate with them themselves um, in the halls, in classrooms, after schools. Um, you're doing projects in your face-to-face -face classroom. So think of different ways that you could continue to build that relationship with the students. If you know that their friends encourage them to reach out to each other and have a discussion online and send you the notes or have them send you, you know, big ideas that they had from that discussion. But be open and flexible to how you can keep them reaching out to you and connecting with you. Because right now, even as an adult, um, I'm having trouble processing everything all at once. So for a student who's 16, you know, maybe even 10, it's a lot harder for them. So if they can reach out to you and they know that you're still there, um, that's a good relationship for them to have. So lastly, we want you to find ways to connect with them. And there's numerous ways. I mean, you can reach out with email or phone calls. Um, but there's different ways and creative ways that you can post in your online classroom um, and reach out to them. So if you find an inspirational quote or a message, um, something that made you laugh, um, a funny video, um, share it with them. Not everything has to be something that's related to lesson or an assessment. Um, just reaching out to let them know, hey, I saw this video, I laughed a little, thought you could use some happiness. Um, one of the things that we encourage our online teachers to do, um, if it's their first time teaching online, is consider video messages. Um, Online learning can be isolating, where you are connecting with people not at the same time, but at varying times. And when you don't see someone physically, sometimes you lose that connection. So you're going from an environment where you saw students every day walk into your classroom, you knew their mood, um, if they were having a good day, if they had a great game the night before. So they can see you and you can see them. And video messages allows them to see that you're still a real person, that you're still here, and that they can still connect with you. So it's a little different the first time you do it, but you get comfortable with it. And it, it brings a lot of communication and a lot of connection um, in a time where some students might need that. So in, I encourage you to try a video message. Um, you could have a shared Google Doc where students share a positive thing that they had happen to them. Um, they can share concerns maybe just with their classmates, um, but it encourages that discussion. So you might consider having a shared Google Doc where all students can participate and share something. And then the last one that we'll talk about before we go forward is the pacing guide and a daily checklist. In your face-to-face -face classroom, you already do this. The students don't know that, that you've done a pacing guide, let alone what it's called. But each day they come in, there's a set chunk of material that you cover, whether it be a project, um, small lessons, if you're reading class novel. But all that's been paced out for them. And so some districts are requesting that you send a week's worth of work um, once a week. To a student who's never chunked out material for themselves, that's a big change. And it can be overwhelming when you look at a week's worth of work. So sending a pacing guide or a daily checklist of here's where you should be at the end of Tuesday um, allows them to see it in sizable chunks like they would in a face-to-face -face class. Um, and kind of each day they can focus just on one aspect of it. So with that said, as you're communicating these things with your students, please be aware that communicating with parents is also just as critical. 
Um, so when you communicate with a student, think about taking that same communication and pulling that parent in just so that they know what's going on, um, what's required of their student, um, that you're still in the picture and that you're available because if you send them communication, they have a way to reach back out to you. So with that, as you're talking with parents, we wanted to pull together a few resources that parents could use. Because like I said before, a lot of parents are still working a full-time job, but they're also kind of filling that role as a teacher or kind of a touchstone at home when a student runs into a problem. So they might be saying, you know, how can I help my student? Um, so Angie, one of our great presenters that, I totally forgot to introduce myself, I'm so sorry. Whoops. Okay, so let's pause right here. So my name is Erin McCracken and I work at Idaho Digital Learning. And I work in the professional development par department. And uh, part of my job is to work with newly hired online teachers, um, our online teachers around the state of Idaho, um, and create professional development. And I work with our fantastic full-time teachers um, who are presenting with me today. So I'm sorry that I didn't introduce us all. Um, Angie Hunter is presenting with me today along with Alicia Larson. Um, I don't know if you ladies want to jump in and introduce yourself really fast. Sure, sure. thanks, Erin. I'm Angie Hunter. I teach full-time for IDLA. And I'm a foreign language mentor and teacher as well. And I'm just excited to be here with you today. As a parent of three elementary kids, I can offer a pretty good perspective on how that's going at home. And we'll talk about that a little later as well. Thank you. Um, I'm Alicia Larson. I'm a, a full-time teacher with IDLA and the lead teacher over social studies. And like Angie, I have five kids at home and ranging from grade two to a senior. And so, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of different dynamics that as teachers, we need to make sure we're, we are considering. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everybody joining and I hope that we are able to share and get some good ideas. Thank you both. Again, I apologize for not introducing us sooner. Um, but this resource, which is what jogged my memory that I didn't introduce everyone, um, was created by Angie. Uh, it'll request that you make a copy. Um, and what that document is, is some resources for parents who may not have you know, a teacher background, they may not have an education background at all, but they do want their student to continue to learn. So it's a list of generic resources um, that are available. But the bottom portion of that document is open for you to personalize. Each district is different and will have different requirements um, of you as teachers and of the students of that district. So we gave you some space to kind of put district specific resources. Um, some districts have their own LMS, some districts do not. Um, so we want you to personalize that document and feel free to share that with parents. Um, link resources that your students are familiar with um, in your face-to-face -face classroom and use that document kind of as a one-stop shop of login information, um, resources that will help them as they go through, um, and consider maybe printing that out um, for districts, we had a conversation today that districts were doing um, some pickup um, locations for materials. So if your district ends up doing that, think about printing that off for parents and allowing them, you know, to write logins or important information um, on those sheets. Erin, do you mind if I interject right here? You sure can. Okay. So... Something that as we started our online schooling last week with our district, um, something that was really difficult for me as a parent and for my elementary student was the logins. Um, a lot of times in elementary school, you have to log in to different places where you can practice like IXL, iStation, Epic Books. There were so many different logins and that's where we struggled as a family and got frustrated is with that. So if you can put them all in one place for your parent and your student, that would be fabulous. Okay. 
I love that idea. The, the, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, the least amount of hurdles or the easiest access we can give our students. Um, we know that that proves to be a productive um, way to go. So we encourage you to, again, follow your direction um, of your district, whatever they're requiring or asking, um, but make sure that you send communication with expectations, um, a schedule, and think about the students' progress. You know, as, as we get further into this, you know, we're looking at a few weeks of, of remote teaching and online learning. So if the parents know kind of that progress, they, they can help their student a little bit more. But the overall key here is consistency. Um, if you send out communication on a consistent basis, it's more predictable, which at this time is fantastic. Um, Angie and I were speaking, and I hope it's okay that I share this, but she gets communication at a specific time um, of day and of the week. And it allows you know her family to to plan a little bit better. So think about consistency and what that offers um, a family at home. And then just as you're available for your students, be available for parents as well. Give them a way to get a hold of you. You know, if their student runs into a hurdle, how can that student reach out to you? And and how can that parent make sure that that they connect their their child with their teacher? So now that we're kind of, we've reached out and we've communicated and we kind of understand what we're communicating and different ways to do that, now we need to start thinking about our lesson design and, and what we're going to actually have our students do. So in an online format, um, you want to be very intentional. So at this time, what you used to do in your face-to-face -face class won't look the same in remote teaching doesn't mean it's worse, it doesn't mean it's better. It's just going to look different. So we wanted to list a couple questions that you could ask yourself as you start to plan. So the first thing is, are the materials and the assessments relevant and necessary to meet the objectives? Again, there's a lot of, I, I don't, what are the words, not constraints, but there's a lot of directives of things that are allowed and things that aren't. So we have to kind of think in a house full of people in this environment, what do what objectives should we try to hit? And how can we make sure that those materials and assessments are relevant? The second thing we want to consider is how long will this realistically take a student to complete? If you think about a whole day at school, you have transition time you have recess for an K through six, you have lunch, you have collaboration time, you have greeting time. Maybe if you are in a middle school or a secondary school, you spend the first 10 minutes just chatting with students, figuring out where they are, what they're doing. Um, all of that time kind of narrows it down of when there's actual instruction and learning time. So thinking about the students um, family dynamics and what their situation is, how much time realistically should you expect a student um, to use to complete this assignment? Erin, this yes. is Alicia. Can I jump in on this one? You sure can. Um, one of the things I think we need to make sure that as, as teachers um, that we don't have the thought, well, the kids are home, they've got all day long, and try to fill that time with with things to, you know, well, they're gonna be bored because they have, especially high school students, they may have five, six, seven other teachers. And if everybody is thinking that same thing and they think, well, they've got this time at home, well, you know, if they work on two, you know, an hour in my class times seven on top of helping siblings, on top of helping parents with, with dinner or other activities. So that's something that, you know, the realistic to complete, but also, you know, don't overfill their time, if that makes sense. I think that's great. Understanding that there are other things, just like in a face-to-face, -face, students deal with outside items just like adults do. So we, we have outside lives and, and understanding that not every moment will be devoted to like it is 
you know, in normal times, if we can call it that. Um, I think that's great advice. Consider that the student isn't only just sitting, waiting for every single thing that you're going to send, that there are other things happening. Um, and the last question we'd like you to, to ask yourself is, is the delivery and format simple, clear, and easily accessible? Like we talked about earlier, when a student hits a hurdle in your face-to-face -face class, they reach out to you to remove that hurdle. But if they are away from you, they could shut down completely and not work because there's a hurdle. So the simplest path that you can give them to access anything um, is the path that you should take. So when you consider these three questions with your content area, we wanted to kind of give you a springboard um, for ideas. So you can reach your specific content area if you'd like, but consider other teachers who you know, you've worked with in your face-to-face -face school and pair up and find some creative um, outcome or list of objectives that they could do together and say, you know, this week for your reading and your science, we're gonna do this project. So feel free to pair up. Um, but I had a coworker who has two girls that are um, second grade and kindergarten, and they spent the morning doing the baking in the math. Um, they made a spice cake and the girls measured everything, they stirred everything, they turned the oven on, and my coworker was just there to observe and, and let them experiment and try. I think the cake turned out well. I think it was actually baked all the way through. Um, but that was their morning activity. So they're using real life math, math that we all use every day when we cook or you know when we bake. So they're still using those skills, but it was in a different format. And so it just looks different. Um, one of the things I thought was really cool under foreign language is make a cultural craft or food. Maybe there's a theme with food for me. I don't know. Maybe pairing anything with food is the way to go at least for me. Um, but one of the last ones is under art, music, and electives. And I was sitting on my porch getting fresh air the other day, and a little boy rode up on his bike with his mom on her bike. And he commented on the plant that was in the bay window that faces the street. And he said, Mom, look, there's a plant. And she said, oh, we can mark that off our list. And so I, I don't know if it was like an I spy or a scavenger hunt that they were playing. But having students kind of feel and experience the world that we're in right now and notice things that maybe they wouldn't regularly notice might be a creative way to get them kind of out of their shell or to do something else. So we hope that these are ideas you can use. If you use them for a springboard, go ahead. Um, but we want you to be creative and understand that the skills and strategies you have in your face-to-face -face that you do to create engaging curriculum, you can still use that as you remote teach. It's just, it's going to look a little bit different. So we hope that these ideas kind of get your brain flowing and moving. And I've talked way too long, so I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions before I hand it over to Angie. Oh, good. We answered every question. That's fantastic. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. And I will hand it over to you, Angie. Okay. Thanks, Erin. Can everybody see my screen okay? You sure can. Okay. Thank you. So I appreciate the things that Erin's talked about so far. And also, I just want to highlight that as a face to face teacher, as a teacher, you do things the same as you would in your class. Maybe you do a bell ringer, maybe you do direct instruction, class discussions. You do these things every day and you can totally transfer those to the online environment. And so I hope that that gives you a little bit of peace. Thinking that you'll have to redesign everything and rethink everything is quite overwhelming. 
And so if we can look for ways that the things that we already do in our face-to-face -face class and look for simple ways to transfer those over, it will be a lot simpler than it may appear on the outside to do this and to achieve this. So here's just some suggestions of things that you might already do in your face-to-face -face and what those might look like in the online setting. I know a lot of teachers do bell ringers. I used to love to do these um, in foreign language class, like do a travel lingua, a, a tongue twister to start off the day, something like that. Those are things that you can still do online. It just might look a little different. And so what I would do, like for my tongue twister to take it online is I would probably do a little quick video of someone doing a Spanish tongue twister. And the student would play that um, from their online class and they would practice it at home. So some other ways that that might look is maybe a link to a song that teaches a specific thing or reviews something a picture journal entry or a written journal entry, maybe that's what you like to do for your bell ringer is a quick little writing assignment or maybe for elementary that's a picture. And that's, that you can do still in a Google document and they can put the date on each day and add their entry um, via you know whatever you've posted as the journal entry theme for the day. Show and tell if you did that in the elementary school that's still totally possible in a live class. In fact, I think it would be a lot of fun to do that. Um, maybe you do a manipulative, like you as the teacher in the live class, you bring something, you show it on the camera, you talk about it, you describe it. That can be just a really fun activity. Um, anything like the shared Google Doc we talked about, maybe you add an image, maybe you add how you're feeling that day, maybe you add a question that's on your mind um, and it's a shared Google Doc that everyone can see and have access to. So that's some ideas for the bell ringer. And um, then of course we have direct instruction. So that can look like a short teacher created video and that's a huge one that we do in the online world all the time is we walk through um, assignments, we walk through instructions, we give instruction in these videos. And the key to those is to keep them rather short as you know, it's hard to watch a long, a long video and keep your attention. So the shorter and more succinct, the better. That direct instruction can also look like a live remote class done in Google Meet like we're in today, or it might be in Zoom or some other platform, but that can be done and then recorded and sent out to those students who may not have been able to attend live. It also looks like a link to textbook material where they can read the material themselves or a link to an outside video, maybe Khan Academy or YouTube has an excellent video that provides that instruction for students. So that, those are some ways you can, you can transfer those to the online environment. Um, class discussions and read alouds. Um, I know this is big, reading aloud in elementary school is huge. Um, somebody gave, I think it was Aaron, gave an example of a teacher who was doing like a bedtime story at night for her students. And so her students can get on live and listen to her reading a book. And so it looks a little different, but it's still exactly the same idea. And it's fun for the students to get on and see each other and listen to their teacher's voice and share a book together. Um, it might be a link to an audio reading where you record it ahead of time, or there's a lot of books online that are already recorded if we're talking elementary. If we're talking secondary, maybe it's a shared Google Doc for class discussion, or maybe it's a collaborative slideshow where everybody adds a slide. Um, or it could be an online discussion forum that you set up, or a live class with discussion either via mic, they can use their audio, or the chat like we have in our Google Meet today. Um, another fun thing with, I think to do just to keep that collaboration and social, you know, social interaction is just to have a social hour once a week for your students where they can come in and chat, but you're, you're there with them, monitoring what that looks like so that nothing inappropriate takes place and then um, allowing them to ask questions, just a, just a question and answer period. Guided practice, um, a lot of times in the online classroom, you do that guided practice as part of the video. Maybe you're showing, you create a video where you use a, an online whiteboard 
and you guide them through what you want them to do. You show them multiply, multiple examples. Um, providing exemplars and examples in the online classroom is huge. Because if you think about it, in the face-to-face -face classroom, you would do that, right? You would show those examples, you'd go through several. And sometimes I feel like that's a step we miss um, online if we're not careful. So making sure you are very explicit in your instructions and then showing a finished product for that student to see because they don't have access to you right you know, live to ask questions. So that becomes very important. Individual practice, well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like an assignment in a Google Doc. It looks like a quiz in a Google Form. It looks like a test in a Google Form, or, or it looks like a discussion board in a shared Google Doc. It looks like a worksheet that you create and send out, um, maybe a Google Slide project, or going back to what Aaron talked about, possibly a creative at home application and then reflection. So that assessment is becomes the reflection of how did it go? What did you do? How did you apply this to the real world? And what did you think about it? What did you learn? And then sometimes teachers have exit tickets, right? So if we transfer this to online, that might look like a checklist, a Google form checklist that you give to students and they just go through and once they complete a task, they, they put a check mark in it. Or it might look like a Google Form questionnaire. You know, what do you understand well? What do you still need help with? Rate your understanding of this concept, things like that. Or maybe it's just when you're in a live class, maybe it's an emoji in the chat, or maybe it's um, a response that you ask them to put into the chat before you close your live discussion. So those are some ideas of how to bring what you already do and just put it into that online world. And, and it's kind of nice to know that you can do that. Like you don't have to recreate the wheel. Are there any questions so far or comments? Yeah. Angie, I'm going to jump in. There's been a, a discussion going on in the chat. Um, a couple of questions, you know, how to support students who don't have the support at home um, and as well as a learning coach, how to not overwhelm the teachers. And I think the key, um, if you're not reading in the chat, I think the key is to keep things simple. Um, if a teacher currently is at the level, you know, as far as technology where a phone call is about what, you know, what they're comfortable with, calling each student and asking them to do certain things and the students can call back if they're if they like Facebook whatever they're comfortable with and then slowly add in different tools that they that they can use and we're going to do a demonstration a little bit that is super super user friendly um, very intuitive that might be helpful um, but as much as anything because this is overwhelming for the students for the parents for the teachers for the administration um, as simple as we can keep it and as much flexibility and communication as we can keep in this online and this remote teaching environment that we're in you know and and recognize that everybody is going to make mistakes one of the one of the great things we have is the standardized testings um having been removed at the federal level that some of that pressure is being taken off and let the the education and the enjoyment kind of take over instead of the checklists and I think if we can keep that in mind, I think everybody can can kind of mesh into what this is going to look like in the next couple of months. Thanks, Alicia. And yes, this please don't take this as I have to do a bell ringer, I have to do direct instructions, I have to do all these things. Absolutely not. Pick one that you want to just practice or start with, or one that feels natural to you and fits your style, and just do one thing. You know, if that's, I'm going to create a teacher video today to provide some direct instruction, then that's great. Just start very simple for sure. So definitely start where you are and build on it. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So maybe this will give some more tangible examples of what you can do and steps to take. So when you're setting up the online classroom, um, something that we always use online is updates and announcements. There's got to be some way of communicating to your students what, you, what the expectations are for the week, you know, what they need to be working on. 
So using those as a way to keep, keep students on pace and on track, but also realizing like, I, I couldn't handle right now working from home and my three kids having to have their work done by the end of the day. So that flexibility of like, maybe it's a week. By the end of the week, this is what you try to have done. So keeping some flexibility, re realizing that parents are working, they may have to work in the evenings with their students or even on the weekends to get, get them caught up. But those students do need those announcements. They need to know what's going on. Um, it, it takes the guesswork out for them. Use the available resources to share content with your students. And I think Alicia grabbed that and put that in the chat for you. So there's a lot of different resources available. We've done another webinar on these. Um, you may listen to the recording. They're on our eDay website. So if you need help with any available resources, that's the place to go. Create personalized videos. We've talked about this one and talked about it, but it's so important um, that you show your face or at least your voice. Um, Loom, we've talked about this one before, but Loom is an excellent video creating and screen sharing software, Chrome extension that you can use to make these videos. It's wonderful. And if you need help with that, please go to the available resources sheet and it will help you with that. Give students information in small chunks. So definitely when students are trying to do this on their own or um, being guided by parents, it's, it's best to give it in small chunks, not huge, long reading assignments and things to do online. Consider like two, the screen time and eyes on the screen. That's important that we don't overwhelm, you know, that can be damaging for students as well. So small chunks is definitely the way to go there. Um, organize content that's easy for students and parents to navigate. Perhaps I jumped in a little too soon with my story, but um, yeah, having all those logins, my student will ask me, mom, how do I log into Epic, you know, books again? And I'll be like, ah, oh, what was that again? Like, cause I've got so many logins and where do I need to go to find that? So having all of that in one place is so fabulous for both parents and students. Um, discussions or collaborative assignments. We've talked about this where students can interact together. This is a fabulous opportunity to do um, projects together or to do um, maybe you meet and present something that you've researched. It's, it's a great opportunity to get those students working together. And, you know, there's something magical about being online and being kind of more um, where you're on your own is you feel more comfortable sometimes interacting with people that you normally wouldn't. So maybe you have trouble in the classroom getting students to pair up, but it, it becomes easier online it become, because they don't have to be right there face to face and, and be nervous. They can do all of it um, through a collaborative document and some great things can happen out of that. Design curriculum and assessments with student accessibility in mind. Um, clearly, we don't know, like there may be students that in our district that do not have any internet services. And I know districts are doing all that they can to provide that or help take advantage of free resources right now that there are in different areas, but also um, offering something else, if not, I had a teacher a foreign language teacher contacted me yesterday and she said, one of my students who normally does all their classwork at the school does not have access to internet at home. So we brainstormed that and we came up with, okay, maybe you can provide some screenshots and because they can still access their email from time to time. And so they're going to, she's going to take screenshots. She's going to transfer some of that information into a Word document, the quizzes that are normally online. Um, she's going to either print those out and mail those to her student, or if they have the capability of opening their email once a week, that's what they're going to do to help that student access the information that they need. And it's extra work. It totally is. Um, but it's worth it if the, to keep the student on track. Consider the steps it will take to access content or materials. So we talked about this being clicks, right? The more clicks it takes a student to get to the material, the more frustrating and time consuming it can become. So just kind of thinking through that as you're designing your content is, 
Is it all in one place? How many clicks does it take? How many logins does it take? And, and how long, like if you sit and think about, okay, I just gave the student a 10 minute video to watch. Then I want them to read this material and kind of estimate the time. Um, and then making sure that students know what's optional and what's not. What happened with my daughter who's in second grade is her, or I'm sorry, my son in first grade, his teacher was just sending like tons of videos, right? And he thought he had to watch every single one which was extremely overwhelming. And then she wrote back because she'd been getting questions and she's like, no, I meant those just as resources if you needed them. So being clear about what they are, what's, what's a resource, what's optional and what do I have to watch is really important so that you don't get that student and parent being completely overwhelmed by having to watch you know, 10 five minute videos. Just pick one. And if you know the material, move on. So being clear about that. So before we get into Google Classroom, the walkthrough, I'd like to see if there's any questions. And I'd also like to ask who has already used Google Classroom or what your level of use is with, the, with that platform. And then if Aaron or someone will kind of help me in the chat. So we had um, we had a couple questions come into the chat. Um, if you aren't reading it, uh, the resource that we shared on the previous slide is a different resource than the parent resource document at the the beginning of this presentation. They are two separate. Um, the available resources is just a document of resources that teachers can use. There's content specific resources. Um, it's just an IDLA document that we had put together. Um, the one at the top is for, uh, has some parent resources. And then there's a spot to put your district or teacher specific, like um, Angie was just talking about things that, you know, require a login, you could put in one place for that, um, that family to, to access. Um, also, a, a great question that I hadn't thought of, um, I hope I pronounce your name right, is it Drema? Um, she asked about if the teacher gets sick and cannot provide online lessons um, or learning packets, what would, that, um, what would that look like or what should they do? Um, and we had a couple answers. Um, hopefully your district does have a plan, um, you know, for, for what that would look like. Um, but you have the ability to reach out to that principal. Um, Alicia had the idea of creating a subfolder, you know, encouraging teachers to create a subfolder um, just for emergencies that there's, you know, we're doing this or we're working on this or something um, that another teacher could kind of step in and, and help those students. So um, those are a couple really great um, questions that came through and then we had a couple say there's limited experience with google classroom um, and then brenda lynn has been using google classroom for four years so we kind of have varying levels um, of experience so okay thank you so please feel free because my experience with Google Classroom is about two days worth of just messing around with it because we don't teach in that platform. But I really have found it to be quite intuitive and easy to use. And, and I'm, I'm going to interject okay. here, but this is a perfect example of we literally are all learning. Like no one is the expert at everything. So hopefully everyone in the call can see this as a great example of you just you you learn on the fly and it is what it is so you're doing you're doing great just remember that absolutely and and just give yourself some grace and and laugh and have some humor and just know that this too shall pass and that we'll we'll learn together and we'll support each other that's what it's all about so um I have a student who is in fourth grade. She is a super independent learner. Um, I haven't had to help her really hardly at all, thankfully. Um, and so because I have a first grader and second grader who need my help and it's very time consuming when I work full time to have to put that on my plate as well. But my fourth graders teacher uses Google Classroom and I got her permission 
to use my daughter's classroom as an example. So I just want to show you how this might look and then I'm gonna walk you through some things step by step. So my daughter Avery logs into her Google account and then she goes to Google Classroom, which if you're not sure where to find that, if you go to like the waffle iron or whatever, the nine dots, if you scroll down, you'll see it. Hers is kind of towards the top. So she just clicks on Google Classroom and then that brings up um, each of her subjects. She's in elementary school. So her teacher has divided them up by subject area. And I've just found this to be so helpful for my daughter because she knows. I just click into each one. I look, like if you look at computers, there's something due tomorrow. In reading, there's something due tomorrow. There's some checklists in her homeroom tab in, or tile where she will need to fill those out. And I'm just going to give an example of how this looks. So she went into math today and there was a math facts quiz. And so she clicked on that and she's already done it, but it was in a Google form. And so this can be really nice. Um, it can actually save you time in the end grading. It will require a little front loading, right? Because you'll have to create the quiz, but she created a math facts quiz. My daughter did it in Google Forms, and then she was immediately prompted, do you want to see your results? Because it auto-graded it. And so she was able to get that feedback immediately, which is really nice. Um, in the online setting, sometimes if you have to wait for that feedback, you feel like you get behind. Or if you didn't understand something and you don't get feedback till days later, then you feel like you're already behind and you've already missed other questions because you didn't understand the first time around. So that is a really nice feature for both teachers and students to save time on grading and to give immediate feedback in on their assessment. So I love that. If we go back to her other classes, I'll show you just a couple other examples. Um, one being, I like these checklists. If you go to her homeroom, she posted a new assignment on the 24th for an assignment checklist. And so this was also created in Google Forms. And so it's basically just a walkthrough. Did you do this like for each course or each subject area, I guess you would say. So in, for spelling, did you do this? If so, check it. In writing, did you go into the writing classroom and complete the assignment? Yes. So it's just kind of a really nice way to keep students on track and help them to, to feel like they're done, right? I'm done for today and I can relax and I can move on. And so I really liked that about her, her class is how it's set up. And there's not something due in every class every day. And I think that's really good and important, especially given this um, time in our lives is we don't have to have something due every day in every subject. So I just wanted to give that kind of as a springboard example. Um, my daughter's been able to navigate that very easily on her own because it's all in one place and it's all organized by subject area and walks her through each thing and, and makes her be, be accountable for those things by checking the box. So just, just something to think about. So if you go into Google Classroom, I just want to help you see how to do some sim things very simply, just to start out with. If you would like, you can join this class. I'll throw it in the chat real quick. Just so you can kind of see how it looks from a student perspective. If you're not familiar with Google Classroom, if you are, you know better than me and should be teaching this probably. So that's the code and, and how you, We'll create the class, we'll just start from the beginning, is I can go back to classes, and I've kind of played around, right? I've created a couple. But from scratch, you would just go to your Google Classroom, like we did with my daughters, after you're signed into your Google Suite. This will come up, and yours will be blank if you've never done anything in Google Classroom before. So what you'll do is you're going to click on this plus sign at the top right. And if you're joining my class, you would click join class and you would put in that class code I just copied into the chat. And if you're creating a class for your students, you'll just click on create class. 
and you'll create a class name. And something that I saw that was on a Google Google workshop video was to include your name in the class name, if, especially at the secondary levels. That really helps students if, if your name's there too. Um, but you don't have to, whatever you're comfortable with. And I'm just gonna put Spanish 1B. You, that's really the only thing you have to put if you feel like you wanna put these other ones in. You can, but it's not necessary. So then I create my class and it's creating <laughs> and it's being slow. There we go. So now I have my class and it's created. I'm going to go back to the one I wanna use with you today, which is how to navigate and show you some things inside of that class. So on this first page, you can use um, this page as this is the stream page. This is where students are going to land when they first come into your class, and this is what they're going to see first. And it's gonna stream everything that you've done, like every assignment you've posted, every announcement, it's just gonna be in a list-like form. So I wanted to bring your attention to just like an announcement that I did, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So I just added, I click into the share something, Share with your class. If you just want to type a message, you can, and you could post that by itself, right? Hi. Or you could add something from Google Drive, a link, a file, or a video from YouTube. Any of those are things that you can add. What I did down here is I added an image, which was kind of an, my announcement. I just wanted to make it a little prettier, and maybe you don't have to do this, but I just thought it might draw their attention to it more if there was a background color. So that's that's what I did there. And I just added that as a file. So what I did, we'll do another one up here. So I said add file. And then I can select files from my device. And so I went to my desktop and I added that announcement. And it's super super fast and, and easily accessible and easily usable. So then I uploaded it. And the thing about that was it, it won't let me post and maybe somebody can help me if they know, but until I type something in here, it would not let me post. So read the announcement, you know, or something like that, announcement below, and then it will let you post. And the nice thing about posting the announcements is you can schedule them out. So if I don't want this to post today and I want to put to post Friday, I can do these ahead of time. So that's something that's kind of cool. Like if you knew you were going to be out or if you weren't feeling well, um, maybe you could front load some of this and schedule it out and what time you want it to post. So then I'm scheduling that to post for a later date. So those are that's kind of some announcement type information. You can, and I love how they can, add comments to these. So like if there was a question or if you, if you wanted to have kind of a back and forth conversation underneath your announcement, then that would be possible. Something that's important, I think, to put in your Google Classroom is where you're, if you're doing a live class at some point, you want to have your link to Google Meets or Zoom or wherever you're going. You want that to be easily accessible. So I put mine, I added a link here. I'll show you how to do that up here. So if I wanna share something with my class and it's a link, I just go to that link and I copy and paste it from somewhere else. Maybe it's um, a video I want them to watch or maybe it's um, a link to my live classroom and I just add the link and then I post it. Okay. That video is quite coincidental, Angie. Right. I had that <laughs> ready. <laughs> so um, that's an easy way that they can just click into your into your meeting or whatever it is, however you're meeting live. They'll just click that link. It'll take them right to my live Google Class Meet, and we'll go from there. So the accessibility, like the ease, is really important. Um, if you want to add, oh, what I wanted to show you too is if this is something, maybe you have an important information post and you want it to always be on top, if you click on the three um, dots on the side, you can move that to the top. 
So I would suggest that like anything that they're needing to access more than once um, or on a regular basis, definitely put that towards the top so they can always find it. So something else you can do is add um, something from Google Drive or um, something from YouTube. So if you just want to look up um, like maybe student orientation, Google Classroom, you can look up a topic. You don't even have to know. You know, it's good to watch the video, of course, first before you post it. But if you know what it is, then it might come up and you can use that video and add that for your students. Something that I would suggest doing the very first day or even couple days is just doing assignments that are orientation based. So just let them get used to the format before you start throwing a bunch of work at them. That could be very overwhelming for students. So just kind of giving them the opportunity to navigate like, oh, here's giving them a, a video on how to navigate Google Classroom, telling them to play around with the different menu options, telling them to post a comment under the announcement. Um, those kind of things, they need practice doing that and navigating the system before they start seeing all the work flying at them. So that's, that would be my suggestion. If, if Let's go and practice with some other files. And I know time is probably getting close, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm going to discard those. But if you go to classwork on the top, so our stream is what they're seeing. It's kind of like a, a Facebook page or something like that, Instagram, a feed. And then if you go to classwork, this is where you're going to add your assignments. So I added some already, like getting started with Google Classroom. And um, I said, watch the video below and then complete the creating create your class assignment. And so there's different ways you can go about this, but if you just click on create, you can choose the type of assessment or even material. So the material doesn't require them to turn anything in, but it's access to something they might need to read or watch in order to be able to complete that assignment. And I think I'll use this time right now to show you um, the resource that we have at IDLA that you, you do not have to have an administrator, um, an administrator do this for you now. And maybe they can throw that in the chat, Erin, that link. So if you just fill out the form and request this, this will give you access to some of our materials that you can use with your students. And I'm just gonna show you one. So we're gonna go to US History 10B. And then we're gonna go down to the Civil War. Now, I would, I would caution you, don't, don't do the introduction or the project instructions. Go to the lesson, and that's where you're gonna find the material. So if I go to this lesson, I can copy the link address and, and go there, right? So I'm gonna show you how it looks, and then I'll show you how to put that link in the materials. So you have access to all this material for your class. And so I know sometimes it's like, oh, I don't wanna have to go create all this content. Well, we're, we're offering that to you um, to use right now. So if you click on the Civil War Begins, it gives you the lesson objectives, kind of an introductory page. And then if you use the navigation arrows on the bottom, it will take you through that lesson. And so you could just assign your student this small lesson as their material, and then create an assessment. Now these do not have assessments within them. It's just a material content resource. So you will need to do an assessment if that's what, how you want to use this. So I just wanna show you that it has videos. It has text. There's some more, a history video. And it's also got transcripts for your students who may need that for accessibility. It's got a song, here's a parody. So using some music and then another video and then a reading assignment. Some of them, and I might not have picked the right one, but some of them also have internet, or I'm sorry, interactivities that the student can practice with, move text around, you know, questions, answering questions. 
So this is a really great resource for you to just quick grab. And then we're gonna take it back to our classroom and we're gonna create a material link. And we're gonna throw that link that I copied for the lesson. Um, sorry, we're not gonna add it there. Title, Civil War. And then if you wanna add some instruction or a description, great. And then you're gonna add the link to that IDLA material. And you're going to paste it in there. And then you can post it. Now over here on the side, you can post to one class or multiple classes. We're just gonna to post to the one class. You can even post to specific students or all students, which is really cool because if you have a student who is on an IEP or a 504, perhaps they need um, some different resources or some extra resources to be able to do their assignment. So that would be awesome to be able to just assign those materials to them. If you wanna create a topic, you can and put it under that topic, then it kind of keeps everything organized. So I could create the topic Civil War and have that posted in that topic. So now um, students can click into that, they can see the link to that material and they can just start moving through it. So that is a really huge time saver if you can find um, material on our, on our resource page that you can use in your class. Are there questions on how to do that? Okay, chime in if there is. Um, just to show you one more, a couple more things and then we'll wrap up. I know your time is valuable. So if I wanna create a quiz, I can click on quiz assignment. And this is awesome because it already brings up the Google form. And so you can click into that Google form and start creating your quiz. Maybe it's on, you know, Civil War. Maybe you're gonna create an assessment to go with that. And so then you start adding your questions and make them required. You can assign points to your questions. You can add an answer key. There's a lot of different um, options for how you want them to answer. Do you want a checkbox? Do you want a short answer, a paragraph, multiple choice? Do you want them to upload a file? That's a good one. Like if you had them do a slideshow or something, you could have them upload that file here. And then they would, they would be able to complete that assessment, send it in, and then you would grade it, and it will show up in their grades. So if you go to grades, it will show each of your students what they have completed and their grades, and it's all in one spot, which is really handy. If you want to invite more people to your class, um, you can either send students the code like I did you, or you can start to type in a name, Robert, since Robert said he was a creeper, I'm gonna use him. <laughs> so I'm gonna invite Robert to join my class. But if you don't want to do that and add every student by hand, you can just send them the code. And then something awesome that I was watching is that you can invite student or parents as well, because parents a lot of times want to be um, on board. They want to see what their students are seeing because sometimes they don't get the whole picture and their student says, I'm done but really they're not. And so this is a way for parents to kind of stay, keep on their student and keep them on track. So that's a very brief and quick um, introduction to Google Classroom, but there are so many videos and things. I posted a bunch for you in here of some good videos that I felt like would be great if you're just starting out in Google Classroom. So if you want to join this classroom and go and view some of those, um, there's some great tutorials on how to do that. Angie, I'm also going to jump in. And those of you who signed into that classroom, if you have your email account, you'll notice that every time she added something, it, it uh, populated an email. So that's another nice tool with Google Classroom so that it's the students know, oh, my teacher put something in there and can go check it out. So those kind of prompts are, are also really, really helpful. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I wanted 
I do want to show you this because it's super important. So let's say I was creating a Google Drive, like I wanted to bring a Google Doc in. And so I am going to go down here and I'm going to choose Google Drive. So I've created something in my Google Drive that I want to use. So maybe it's um, a document like this one. Now, something that's super important to remember is over here it says students can view file. If you leave it there, students can only view it and they can't edit it. If you change it to students can edit file, then all students will be editing the same Google Doc and it's gonna be a huge mess. So you're gonna to wanna to click on this bottom one, which is make a copy for each student, which is what my daughter's teacher does. So she clicks into her own Google page, it creates her own copy, and then she completes the assignment. So that's super important to remember to click that bottom one when you do that. And then you can assign points over here, you can make it ungraded or graded, assign a due date, you can add your rubrics, however, however you wanna do that, and then you click assign, and it's there. So I know that that was just a really quick and crazy introduction, but I hope it at least eases some concerns of, hey, I can do this. This isn't that bad, and I have resources available to me. Um, so do we have any questions before we go? I do want to thank you all for your time and just say we can totally do this together and we're all going to learn and we're all going to make mistakes, but we're going to be so much better off in the end. I'd like to echo that too. I know that some of you are on spring break. So the fact that you came today and listened and, you know, are concerned about how to move forward, it shows how much you care about your students. So um, we're here to help. Just a reminder that our eDay website, we do have um, online support um, and live support Monday through Friday from eight to four. So if, as you are planning, you run into any hurdles, you can go to our eDay website and it's a green button that says request live support. Um, and somebody's there Monday through Friday, eight to four. So feel free. Um, to do that. Sorry, I was reading a chat. So Brenda Lynn, I think that you are not able to join because you are not part of our domain, which I don't think that we really realized until just now. Um, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, so if your district has the G Suite set up, um, you can rewatch um, kind of how to get your classroom set up and you can invite other teachers within your district for them. Um, you can create multiple classrooms. So you could create like a sandbox classroom or you could play if you wanted to. Um, but we know it's 3.08, so we went a little bit over, but we appreciate you staying with us. Um, we're happy to stay and answer any questions that you may have. Um, but that was all we had planned. So again, thank you for joining us and uh, best of luck and we're here if you need us.